good morning, church. Now, this probably goes against the spirit of the series somewhat. Drew sort of acted like I came up with this idea because I love the lake, but I actually don't really love the lake at all. I'm not really a lake guy. Um, I know some of you are, but I'm, I'm not really a lake guy. There's a lot of things I don't like about the lake. I, first of all, I don't like swimming in the lake. I think that is weird. In fact, whenever I'm in the lake and I find myself in the lake, I just imagine there are all these creatures like lurking below the murky water, ready to nibble at me or, or, or eat me outright. Um, I just can't escape. The, I have these images in my brain of these giant aquatic whatever's you know, taking me out. Uh, I also you know, don't like fishing. I know some of you love to fish on the lake and that's your thing and it's so relaxing. Oh, I find fishing to be so mind-numbingly boring. I can't do it. I'm sure if I went to the lake with you and you taught me how to fish and we caught whatever you catch, like I would have a good time. But as of right now, as of today, I don't like fishing on the lake. And while I do enjoy tubing on the lake, I've been tubing, that's kind of fun. I just like being thrown from the tube, which is what happens every time that I go because the driver says, hey, get on the back. We're just, I'm just gonna take it easy. Just enjoy the ride. But inevitably what happens, he does his best to you send me skipping across the lake water. He's always successful because evidently that's an easy thing to do. And so I'm just not a, you know, a lake kind of guy. This lake's just not my thing. Now, with all that said, I know some of you do love the lake. You enjoy the lake. You enjoy fishing. You enjoy swimming in the lake. You enjoy water skiing and jet skiing and tubing and all those other things. You know, you love, you know, putting on your boat hair, don't care, you know, kind of shirt and just cruising across the lake and just enjoying being with your family. In fact, maybe some of you are even at the lake right now watching online and you can't, you look forward to the rest of your day at the lake. I know there's a lot of you that just love the lake. Well, if that's you, whether you realize it or not, you actually have something in common with Jesus. Jesus loved the lake life too. He was all about the lake. He went fishing on the lake. He took naps on boats as they made their way across the lake. The lake is even where Jesus set up his ministry headquarters. In fact, in the town of Capernaum, Jesus set up his entire ministry right there off the lake. This is Capernaum, the town of Jesus. I've been there. And it's an amazing place because it really is. It's a fishing, it was a fishing village in the first century. It's right on the lake. You can see the lakes right here. You can see the cities over here. You can see some of the houses, the ruins of some of the houses. And the lake is where Jesus spent his ministry. There's the synagogue where Jesus most likely taught. Um, so, so Jesus was all about the lake in the distance. Jesus was all about the lake life. He really oriented his entire ministry around the lake. Now the specific lake that Jesus spent so much of his time around was referred to by most first century writers as the Sea of Galilee, but it wasn't actually a sea. It was just what they called it. It was a, a lake. Anyway, in Mark's account of Jesus' life, and there are four accounts, right? There's Matthew's account, Mark's account, Luke's account, John's account. But in Mark's account of Jesus' life, he tells us about three particular moments that happened in succession at or around this lake. And over the next three weeks, I want us to look closely at each of these moments because I think that each of these moments have something to say to each of us, something that we absolutely need, need to, to hear. So, so let's get right to it. This is Mark's account again of Jesus' life. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. He did this often. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. So Jesus is teaching by the lake and the crowd is so large, maybe it's crushing because they want to get near the miracle worker. They want him to heal their son or their daughter or their husband or their wife of that disease, you know, to touch the leper. Everybody's clamoring to get to Jesus and he's pressed on every side. And so Jesus makes the decision, I'm going to get into a boat. I'm going to paddle a couple of yards away and I'm going to teach from the boat because I have something I want to say. I have something that needs to be heard. So this is what Jesus did. So, so if you can just picture Jesus kind of paddling off the shore a little bit, sitting down in the this boat beginning to teach. And then Mark tells us this. He taught them many things by parables. Now, if you don't know what a parable is, I've defined it for you. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. And Jesus was always using parables. The parable of the prodigal son is probably his most famous. The parable of the good Samaritan is another one that we know about. And so he was always using these simple stories to kind of hook the listener in to make a moral or spiritual point, to make some sort of uh, point. And so he taught many parables. In fact, let's go back to Luke 2 again. He taught them many things by parables. So this is, we're gonna look at one of those parables. And in his teaching said, so let's look at this one particular parable. Listen, 
a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Now, most of Jesus' listeners that day would have either cared for their own field or gardens, or they would have cared for someone else's field or gardens. So Jesus is talking about someone, something that really everyone in the audience can understand, everyone can relate to, everyone can see what he's saying. Jesus paints this picture of a, of a farmer who has this bag of grain, think of like an extra, lag, extra large fanny pack, okay? And he's reaching into this bag and he's just scattering seed everywhere. It seems as if he's careless, as if he's reckless, but he's just throwing seed on all kinds of ground. He throws it on the hard ground and this would be the ground around the fields. It would have been almost like a sidewalk because they would, work, they would walk along their, uh, outside of their fields as they took care of it. They would walk in between it. There'd be a hard ground in between it. But this farmer doesn't care. He's just throwing seed everywhere. He's throwing it in thorny places and rocky places he's just slinging the seed everywhere and again the seed lands on on four very unique kinds of terrain some of the seeds the farmer sows end up on these hardened paths again that surround the fields some of these seeds land in rocky places where there's good soil but right underneath the soil not far underneath the soil there's a layer of rock there's a layer of limestone and so the seed you know really can't plant any roots because it hits something it's not able to really grow up and produce the fruit it needs to some of the seed lands in thorny areas where there's potential for it. The, the soil's good but there's so many other things competing for that same soil that uh, they lose out to the competition, the seed loses out to the competition, and then finally some of, the, some of the seeds fall on the rich, fertile, good soil where the seeds can thrive and become what they were intended to become. And then Jesus, after he introduces them to this story, says, says these sort of mysterious words. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear, which is really Jesus' way of saying, I hope you were really listening to that story because there's something happening in that story that affects every single one of you. Whoever has ears to hear, hear. Now, upon hearing the story, Jesus' closest friends and followers are totally confused. And the reason they're so confused is because they know this is a story about something else, right? They know this is a parable. They know that this is, he's trying to teach them some sort of moral or spiritual lesson so that they can you know, learn from this. But they cannot, for the life of them, understand what it is that Jesus is trying to communicate. So, when he was alone, the 12, this is later in the day, when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. So these people who are closest to Jesus, his 12 disciples and some others who were also around approach him and say, Jesus, listen, we really feel like we were listening closely to your story. We, we feel like we have ears to hear. We feel like we're dialed in. And yet, we have absolutely no idea what that parable about the seed and the soils is all about. Would you maybe give us a hint or something? We're trying to connect the dots and we just, we just can't. Now, typically, if you've ever read the, the accounts of Jesus' life, you know that Jesus doesn't explain his parables. More often than not, he tells a, a captivating story, drops the mic, and says, like, you were a good audience, Magdala. You get him a good night, and he just leaves, right? No, he doesn't actually do that, but some version of that, right? He doesn't explain. He just kind of leaves people with the story, and they sort of figure it out on their own. But on this unique occasion, he elaborates. He provides a little play-by-play -play commentary. First, he explains what the seeds represent. He says, the farmer... The farmer in the story, he's, the seed that he's sowing is the word. The farmer sows the word. So I don't know if you know a lot about seeds. I, I don't really know a lot, but here's what I do know. Seeds are generally small in size. However, they're, despite their size, when they're buried in the right kind of soil, when they're placed in the right kind of ground, when they're watered, when they're exposed to sunlight, they have the potential to be transformed into something extraordinary. 
In fact, a solitary apple seed, given the appropriate time and placed in the appropriate conditions, can literally produce an apple tree, uh, apple tree, which in turn can produce hundreds of apples, which in turn has the potential to produce orchards and orchards and orchards of apple trees, all from one seed. So Jesus is saying in this moment that his words, even though they may not seem like much to so many, have the potential if placed in the right conditions, if buried in the right kind of soil, can produce something extraordinary in the lives of others. In fact, if the soil, if the ground is ready to receive what he is saying, new life will spring up, growth will take place, fruit will be produced, change, transformation will happen. But, if the soil is not ready to receive what he is saying, then nothing will happen. New life will not spring up. Growth will not take place. Fruit will not be produced. Change will not happen. Here's what Jesus is saying. Everything depends on the conditions. Everything, the success of the seed depends on the conditions that it's placed in. And then Jesus explains these conditions. He begins to talk about how how each kind of soil represents our different responses to the good news about who he is. Now, just so you know, every single person in this room and every single person watching this online right now is one of these four types of soil. That when the good news comes our way, we all respond in one of four unique ways. And then Jesus tells us. He explains the parable. Some people are like seed along the path. That's that hard ground, right? Right? where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes, a word, takes away the word that was sown in them. So there are some people, this is what Jesus is saying, who when they are presented with the truth of who God is, when, when they are presented with the truth of who Jesus is, their hearts are so hard that the seed has absolutely no possibility of penetrating it. Now, I don't know if you've ever met anybody like that or not. You probably have. But these are people in your life and mine who, when you begin to talk to God about them, when you, get, when you, when you begin to talk about the difference God has made in your marriage, in your parenting, these people, they typically shut down this conversation, right? They don't want to hear it. They don't have time for that. Good for you, but I don't want anything to do with, with that at all. These people leave the room, right? They walk away from you. And the reason they aren't interested in anything that you have to say, them, to say to them is because, according to Jesus, their hearts are hard. Their hearts are like concrete, impenetrable soil. And, and so what happens inevitably is the good news about Jesus literally just bounces off of them. It can't, it, it can't stick, it can't stay, it, can't be, it just bounces right off of them. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. There are some people that are just so hard-headed, so hard-hearted, that the good news has little to no hope of penetrating, of sinking into their hearts. That's what he's saying. There are some people, and you know these people, right? Some of this issue should be your story. The good news had no hope. But there's people in your life, the good news has no hope right now because that person is so hard-headed, so hard-hearted, it has little to no hope of, of penetrating or sinking into their hearts. Then Jesus describes another potential response. He says, others, there's the hard ground, but others, like seed sown on rocky places, Hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So just as there are some people who the seed bounces off of, Jesus said there are others who take in the seed, who initially respond in some way to the good news about Jesus, but th this reception is only short-lived. They are like rocky soil. Now, again, I'm not very agricultural at all, but after doing a little bit of homework, I discovered, and I sort of referenced this earlier, but when there's a layer of rock underneath the soil or there's limestone or something hard like that, seeds planted into that kind of soil won't be able to develop the appropriate root system to sustain the life that initially emerges from the surface. The, the seed can't go all the way down, can't develop a proper root system, and as a result, <clears throat> even though there's an initial sign of life that, that emerges from the ground, from the ground, it won't last long. It won't last long at all. Now, I don't know, again, if you've ever met anyone like that, but these are the people in your life and mine who are seemingly open to the good news 
about Jesus. And yet, as soon as the slightest problem shows up in their lives, they're quick to abandon ship. They weren't really a follower of Jesus in the first place. These are people who oftentimes, maybe they pray a prayer or they verbalize a decision, but they don't actually take into consideration what it means to truly follow Jesus. In other words, there are some people who have a religious experience that only produces a short-lived religious excitement. I'm guessing you probably know some people like that, right? They had a religious experience, it, but it only created a short-lived religious excitement. Nothing truly transformational happened. It was a short-lived experience. They do, these people, you know what they don't do? They, don't let, they let the good news sort of get in, but they don't let it go all the way in. They don't let it go all the way down. In fact, as soon as any sort of challenge comes their way, because they've only had what amounts to a superficial response to Jesus, they bail out. And then Jesus describes yet another kind of soil. He says, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it un." Fruitful. So Jesus says, hey, there are still others who understand and respond to the word. The good news goes in somewhat deep. But it isn't long until they allow other things to also penetrate the soil. Jesus says, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things. There's these competing priorities and they're all competing for the same rich soil. And ultimately, when we give into those things and we make those the priority, they, they steal away the nutrients from the seed that was planted there. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. There are some people who are interested in the kind of life God offers, but they are more interested in the kind of life the world dangles in front of them. There, there are some people who are interested, they're interested in the kind of life God offers, and they're not gonna write that off. They're, they're, they're gonna be curious and maybe even pursue that a little bit, but ultimately they're more interested in the kind of life the world dangles in front of them. These are the people who just allow any number of competing priorities to invade their lives and win out over their relationship with God. And then finally, Jesus talks about one more kind of soil, the best kind of soil. He says this, others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So finally, there are some who hear the good news, they understand it, they fully accept it, and they show evidence in their lives that it has taken root down deep. There is growth, there is transformation, there is progress, there is change. The seed that was planted in them, in other words, falls on this receptive, uh, fertile soil. This person not only hears the good news about who Jesus is and, and responds to it, but they open up their entire lives to this good news. They reorient their entire lives around who Jesus is and what he wants them to do. This seed settles in and begins to germinate and grow until there is something there that wasn't there before. And here's what Jesus is saying. There are some people who are forever changed by their encounter with the good news. There are some people who are, their life is turned upside down in a good way because their encounter with the good news. Not only does new, new life spring up, but continual, steady growth happens. Fruit is produced, and not just fruit in small quantities. Fruit is everywhere. Life change is affecting every aspect of this person's life. And then with that, Jesus has really wraps up his explanation. Now in the time we have left, I wanna talk about how all of this applies to, to all of us. I don't know about you, but as I read this parable, the first thing I see is, a, is an individual who is on a mission to scatter as much seed as possible. I mean, this dude is throwing seed everywhere. He is throwing it on every kind of ground imaginable. And I think Jesus' point is that when it comes to us talking about our faith, telling others about our faith, when it comes to, to communicating the good news to anyone that we're connected to, our job is not the, to find the right kind of soil, to look for the fertile soil and then scatter there and plant there and, and water there. That's not what he's saying. Our job, this is what Jesus is saying, is to scatter seed everywhere. 
Our job is not to go looking for the right kind of soil. Oh, you're hard soil, so I'm just going to stay away from you. Or you're thorny soil. Or, oh, there's maybe some rich, fertile soil here. I'm going to plant here. No, our job is just to scatter seed recklessly everywhere that we go. We're just to continually, constantly scatter seed. We're not to be obsessed with what kind of soil it lands on. Our job, in a very real sense, is to get the word out. Not, not only that, but I think Jesus wants us to know that as much as we'd like to think we can change the soil, we can't. We are, we are powerless to change the soil. I can't change the soil. You can't change the soil. I mean, honestly, we can't do anything about the soil. We are powerless in and of ourselves to affect the soil. But as we are faithful in scattering the soil where we live, work, and play, inevitably what happens is that some of the seeds that we scatter will fall on the right kind of soil will fall on good soil, on fertile soil. I've, I've already alluded to this earlier, but I'm not agricultural at all. But I do, if you ask me to understand and explain one principle related to agriculture, I could explain one, and here's what it is. You reap what you sow, right? You reap what you sow. You know this, I mean, we all know this probably. You reap what you sow. I know that if I plant corn, there is no possible way that I'm going to reap cucumbers. Now, I may not reap corn either, okay, because again, I don't know what I'm doing. But if I plant corn, I can tell you there's, watermelon is not going to emerge from the earth. Tomatoes are not, I mean, this is not going to happen, right? It's not the way it works. You reap what you sow. The opposite, though, is true as well. You can't reap what you don't sow. It's impossible to harvest something that has never been planted, you cannot reap what you don't sow. If you sow nothing, do you know what you reap? Nothing. That's the way it works. Practically speaking, here's what this means. I can dream about a beautiful garden, buy all the supplies and seeds necessary to plant one, and even Google how to create the garden of my dreams. But if I don't actually take the time to get down in the dirt and get my hands dirty, and do some work, and put some seeds there, and cover it with dirt, and water, and make sure everything is tended to carefully, then nothing will ever emerge from the ground, right? This is what Jesus is saying. Now, here's how this applies to you and me, and, and, and I hope you'll listen as I apply this as specifically as I know how. You can dream about your friends and family members meeting Jesus. You can hope that your coworkers and classmates and CrossFit buddies enter into a relationship with God. You can pray that all these different people's eyes will be open to the truth of who Jesus is. But if you don't actually take the time to start scattering seeds yourself, you shouldn't be surprised when no life change happens. You shouldn't be shocked when no fruit is produced. You shouldn't be shocked that they're alive, that they never respond to who Jesus is because you haven't told them. Nothing, you can't reap what you don't sow. So here's our, here's our takeaway this morning because some of you are, are probably wondering, where do I start, Matt? What does this look like? Well, the answer is, is simple. You start right where you are. In fact, plant seeds in the ground you're around. I don't know what kind of ground you're around. You're, the ground you're around is different than the ground I'm around. But I know you're around some ground. You're around some hard ground. You're around some thorny ground. You're around some rocky ground. You're also around some fertile ground. And the only way to know what kind of ground you're around, start planting seeds. Start scattering seed. And see what happens. Will you encounter some hard ground? Absolutely. Where there'll be some people who it seems as if they initially respond to the good news. Yes, but then they fall away. Absolutely. But will there be some who are absolutely changed by the good news because you told them what God has done for you through Jesus? Yes, absolutely that's what will happen. And it really doesn't matter what kind of ground you're around. Again, that's not your job. You don't even need to try to figure out, well, I think this, my coworker over here, he's some really hard ground, so I'm just not gonna scatter any seed in his direction. Or, or my neighbor, you know, he's thorny ground, if I've ever seen thorny ground, or whatever. You know. No, 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 that's not our job. We don't define the soil around us, the ground around us. We're responsible for just recklessly scattering seed, reaching into our bag and just slinging it wherever we find ourselves. That's what Jesus says. And maybe 
there'll be a harvest because the seed that you scattered landed on the right kind of soil and maybe there won't be. But it doesn't matter. In fact, here, let me just let me word it a different way. You are not called to be successful at this. You are called to be faithful in this. You're not to be called to be successful in this, but, but to be faithful in this. Not only that, let me say it another way. You are not called to create conversions as much as you are called to create conversations. I think sometimes we put the weight of the world on ourselves and, well, I, I have to convert them. No, no, no. You just have to talk to them. You, you, you just have to talk. You're called to be faithful in this, not successful, whatever that is, in this. You're not called to create conversions. You're called to create conversation. Our, our responsibility is to tell them, tell people that God loves them, Jesus died for them, he rose again to prove that he was who he said he was, and if they will put their faith and trust in him and him alone, he will change their life for the better, not just now, but for all eternity. That's our job. Now, some of you, you've been sowing seeds for as, as long as you can, can remember, honestly. You've been attempting to plant seeds in the ground you're around, and mostly you've encountered hard soil, shallow soil, thorn-infested soil, and if that's you, let me just say this. Don't lose heart. Again, you're not called to be successful in this. You're called to be faithful in this. Keep scattering seed, because here's the reality. I've seen this. You've seen this. Soil can change, right? What was once a hard heart can become a much softer heart. Soil can change. That's not your job to change the soil, though. Your job, keep scattering seed, keep planting seed in the ground you're around. Now, with that said, I want to be perfectly clear because I think we all need to make sure we understand. Not only will we all run into these various kinds of soils, but ultimately, and I said this earlier, whether you realize this or not, every single one of us is one of these kinds of soils. Every single person watching online, you are one of these kinds of soils. Every single person sitting in this room, you are one of these kinds of soils. Some of you, you're hard soil, you're hard ground. You've heard the good news over and over and over again, and yet you have been largely unaffected and unmoved by it. In fact, you're only here today or you're only watching online today because your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or somebody in your circle of influence has asked you to do this, and you just tolerate this for them. And your heart is hard and and the seed just bounces off of you. If that's you, that is a dangerous place to be. And you need to pray that God, right now, just pray, God, would you soften my heart? I don't want to be that. I'm not sure that I want to go all in yet and give my life to Jesus, but I don't want to, if this is true, I don't want to be that hard soil. I don't want to have a, a heart that's like concrete. I don't want to be that. Some of you, though, you're, you're shallow soil. And here's what I mean by that. Your Christianity is superficial. Your Christianity is superficial. While you may have made an emotional decision somewhere in the past, you, you responded, maybe you prayed a prayer, but that's, that's it. That's, that's as far as your Christianity goes. There's never been any real change. And you should know that your superficial Christianity will not help you in any way whatsoever. In fact, it will disappear when life gets tough because it's, it can't sustain you. It's superficial, it's fake. It's, re, it's a religious experience and that's it. And if that's you, all, if all you ever had was a religious moment where you prayed a prayer and nothing changed, then I would say this, the good news has not gone all the way down. The seed has not gone all the way where it needs to go, and you need to make sure today that you let it go all the way down. And then some of you are, are more like the thorny soil. It, the good news went down for, for a while, or at least it seemed like, and then you got distracted by all that was going on in life. You got distracted by this or distracted by that. All these competing priorities stole away from what that seed was, was those nutrients that that seed needed. You gave your attention, your devotion, your worship to other things. And as a result, the seed that was planted in you can't mature and can't grow and, and won't do you any good. And then some of you are the fertile, healthy soil. You've heard the word. You've responded to the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done, and you've let it go all the way down, and it affects every part of your life. It affects how you love your husband, how you love your wife, how you parent your children, how, how you do your job. It affects every aspect and area of your life. You are steadily, consistently growing more and more, progressively, day by day, into the person God wants you to be. 
Now, one last thing, and I've sort of said this, but I just want to say it one more time, really in a different way. And boom. You can't help what kind of soil someone else is. Okay, just I want you to understand that. You cannot help what kind of soil someone else is. But you are absolutely responsible for what kind of soil you are. You can't help how other people respond to the good news, but you can decide how you're going to respond to the good news. You, you can't help what your friend, your family member, your neighbor, your coworker, you can't uh, ultimately decide how they respond to the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done. But you can decide for yourself. And if you're thorny soil or you're rocky soil or you're hard ground, you need to make the decisions today that you don't want to be that kind of ground anymore. You want the good news about Jesus to go all the way down. And if you've been personally changed by Jesus, then you know what you need to do? You need to do what others did for you. Someone, at some point in your life, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a pastor, maybe it was a close family friend, someone scattered seed in your direction. Somebody threw seed at, at you. Somebody, somebody planted some seed in the ground that they were around and you were a part of their circle of influence. And what was done for you, you need to make sure that you do for others. You need to recklessly scatter seed wherever you find yourself. You need to plant seeds in the ground you're around. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news. And God, thank you for sending Jesus to do something about our sin problem. And would you just help us to all this morning do a thorough evaluation of our lives to investigate whether or not the good news has made its way all the way down or not. So God, if there's anyone here this morning there's been no fruit in their lives, help them to investigate and be honest with themselves. Did I just have a religious experience or did the good news about Jesus truly change my life? 